fake news. The Bible doesn't exactly say that. We've been looking at, for a few weeks at some, some common misunderstandings, and trying to clear up a few of them surrounding different phrases we use in culture all the time. Things that are often attributed to God or the Bible, but in reality, it's not exactly what it says. We looked at the idea that God won't give you more than you can handle it. We realize it's really more of a matter of God won't give you more than he can handle. And we must lean on him for his strength. We talked about the idea that, you know, people say God helps those who helps them who help themselves. And although God wants us to work with him, that idea just goes totally against the idea of grace. Grace is God giving to us, God doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. And this week, we're going to talk about uh, perhaps one of the most abused and misunderstood and dangerous ideas. We, we really mean well sometimes when we've said everything happens for a reason. It's, it's kind of a half-truth. I remember when I was, well, this past week, uh, Josiah and I watched a, uh, a newly made documentary about, about 9-11 and terrorist attacks. And, and it, was, it was really interesting to hear from people who were you know, part of our government's leadership and what was going on behind the scenes. And, and it brought back a lot of uh, memories and I found myself getting more emotional than I would have thought. It was really quite moving. And, and I'm sure a lot of you remember that day very well. One of the things that I remember in the days after that, though, was a, a couple of, of preachers who had the idea that, uh, that the terrorist attacks were judgment from God. And I just remember thinking, God didn't fly those planes into the building, those terrorists did. Those planes hit that building they did hit the building for a reason. The reason wasn't God. The reason was some evil people did something evil and used the free will God gave them to hurt other people. That's the truth of the matter. Was there a reason? Sure, but the reason wasn't God. If we turn on the, the news in the past week, uh, we've seen people in Afghanistan living in fear of a, a brutal new regime that is taking over. We've seen a hurricane that has caused devastation from Louisiana through New York. There was a student shot at a high school in North Carolina this week. Did all these things happen for a reason? Maybe, but that reason isn't gone. There are well-meaning people who would say, yes, everything happens for a reason. And the truth is they desire to make sense out of something that doesn't make sense. We don't like that idea. And the truth is, sometimes things don't make sense because we live in a fallen world. Sometimes people abuse the freedom God has given them and it hurts others. And sometimes we're just at the mercy of a creation that has been scarred by sin. There are people who would disagree with me. Uh, there was a, a French theologian named uh, Elbert Schweitzer, who said, eventually all things fall into place. Until then, laugh at the confusion, live for the moments, and know everything happens for a reason. Uh, Oprah Winfrey was quoted as saying, I trust that everything happens for a reason, even if we're not wise enough to see it. And that idea sounds, it sounds good. It sounds wise. It sounds thoughtful. And you know what? Yeah, most things do have a reason, but the reason isn't always good. The reason doesn't always make sense of it. At best, the idea that everything happens for a reason is a half-truth. Uh, right as writer Nicholas Claremont writes, everything happens for a reason is my very least favorite thing for someone to say. It's bad philosophy, bad theology, bad thinking, and bad advice. It manages to combine the maximum of ignorance with the maximum of arrogance. Pastor uh, John Pavlovitz writes, while God certainly gives our lives meaning, 
the idea that everything we suffer, all the horrible experiences we've endured, have a purpose and meaning is actually harmful to our Christian walk. There are these different people who, who would disagree with me, but uh, to believe that God has a reason for every terrible thing that we will walk through in this life is what you might call theological determinism. That everything is determined ahead of time that we really have zero free will. That idea of determinism, it's a fancy way of saying everything happens for a reason. It's a way of saying that God must be so sovereign that there is zero free will in the world. So determinism is a way of saying that everything happens for a reason and God is the reason. But, but that's a dangerous idea that is often spoken by very well-meaning people. To attribute a recent earthquake or a hurricane uh, as an act of God, or where she had a judgment of God, really doesn't fit with the character of who we know God is. I might jokingly say this, the next time Somebody says to you that everything happens for a reason. Step on their toes. Give them a good squish and say, that happened for a reason. God must have been God's will that your toes be stepped on today. I don't think they would. They might see that there's a little more going on than, than God's will. There's a branch of the theological tree that, that we're on. You know, we have our own sort of tribe where we're Nazarenes. Beyond that, we are uh, Wesleyans. Beyond that, we are uh, our Protestants. And, of course, above all, we are Christians. But in our Wesleyan uh, tribe, we talk about free will. We talk about the fact that that. The truth is, without free will, love cannot exist. And certainly we read through the Bible, and the Bible says God is love. We, we read about the reason for Jesus coming and dying on the cross for our sins, that it's about love, that it's about the greatest love, him laying down his life for us. But the truth is, love doesn't exist unless it's a free choice. You, if, if we are puppets on a string with no option to, but to play out sort of the programming we were pre-programmed with, then we can never really love God. Because love is a choice. It's an exercise of free will. We understand that, that God is sovereign, but we understand that that sovereignty is balanced with the free will that he has chosen to give us. It's not that we don't believe God is sovereign, we do, but we believe in his sovereignty. He has created us with this capacity to choose freely. We believe that God knows everything that will happen, sure, but knowing what will happen doesn't mean he necessarily has to cause it to happen. That's the difference between, that's what we call foreknowledge. Foreknowledge doesn't mean uh, preordained. It simply means that God knows what will happen, but gives us the freedom to, uh, to make choices along the way. So no, God is not the cause behind everything. I believe in God's sovereignty, but because God is sovereign, I believe it's within his power to allow re real free will in his creation. I guess from a technical standpoint, everything does happen for a reason. There is cause and effect. There is cause and effect. Yesterday, I was uh, had a full cup of coffee. And I went to take a drink, 
I had to jump up very quickly because the handle fell off my coffee mug and I'm holding the handle while the coffee dumps in my lap. I moved very quickly and uh, things worked out okay, but, but here's the truth. God didn't want me to go, dump my coffee in my lap. I don't believe that. What I do think happens is a few years ago, the handle broke off that coffee mug and I super glued it. And then we've run it through the dishwasher hundreds of times. And guess what? The glue didn't hold it. There is a reason why that coffee mug broke. It wasn't necessarily an act of God. It was because the glue didn't hold anymore. I probably shouldn't have uh, run it through the dishwasher anymore. There is cause and effect. But that doesn't mean God causes every single thing that happens to us. Perhaps somebody had to stay in a hotel because a hurricane hit their home. Perhaps there was a car accident because it snowed the night before and it was slippery. Sometimes there are reasons. Sometimes that reason is the choices we make. Sometimes the things we choose to do or not to do have unintended consequences. So there, is a, there are reasons behind the choices we make. There are reasons behind the things that, we, that happen. But uh, that's not necessarily the, the, it's not necessarily an act of God. Everything happens for a reason. Sometimes the reason is our own stupid mistakes and bad decisions. Sometimes the reason things happen are simply accidents. Accidents do happen under this idea of cause and effect. But the effect of whatever caused the accident, um, it's not a, a judgment on God. There are tragedies that happen by what we might call accidents. And there's certainly there's a reason if, if there's an accident on the highway, when a car blows a tire, well, the, yes, there is a reason the car blew a tire, but there is, it's an accident, it's a tragedy, unpredictable, unexpected. Sometimes the, re sometimes, sometimes the reason why things happen is divine intervention. We do believe that God intervenes in our lives. We believe that God answers prayer. We believe that God uh, walks with us through this life. And we may not always understand God's timing, but sometimes God chooses to intervene in things and bring about certain results. So it would be wrong to say uh, that there are not times where God is the reason things happen, but it would also, but it would be more correct to say everything happens for a reason, but God isn't the reason everything happens. There's cause and effect happening all around us. The reason behind things sometimes is natural and sometimes is willful. There are accidents that happen. And then there are times when God is at work in orchestrating things. And life is a mixture of the two. We have to be careful not to attribute everything to God. It's a very short leap from the idea that God is the reason behind everything. It's a short leap to saying God is to blame for everything. And I think when we say it that way, we realize, well, that doesn't sound right. So where did this idea come from? Basically, uh, I think part of the reason this idea comes about is because as human beings, we don't like unsolved mysteries, and we don't like silence. This is very important. Listen to this. People don't really like silence and unsolved, unanswered questions. It gets uncomfortable. When faced with a situation with no logical explanation, it's human nature to try to solve it, to try to find meaning in it, to break the silence and say something, anything. It's frustrating to not know 
why something happened. Sometimes we struggle with handling the silence of not knowing what to say. And so we run into a, a mystery in life, a tragedy we can't explain or can't handle the silence of. And we say what we might call Christian platitudes. Everything happens for a reason. The problem is the idea really isn't in Scripture. So, so why do people say this? Well, is, is with all these fake news stories we've been talking about, uh, there is a Scripture that says something similar or something that might sound something like it. And so the, the culprit today is Romans 8.28. So go ahead and look at, if you have a Bible, you can look up Romans 8, 28. And it's where I think this idea comes from. But we have to be careful to, to look at this scripture in context and think about what it's really saying. In the contemporary English Bible, it puts it this way, Romans 8, 28. We know that God works all things together for good for the ones who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, honestly, this does sound similar to our phrase today. And I can see where the confusion comes from. And because of this, many well-meaning people perhaps aren't helpful when they say everything happens for a reason. Sometimes those very words meant to help can hurt. We say them because we're trying to say something kind. But perhaps the better response is simply, I don't know why, but I know God is here with us. He's here with you in the midst of this. God is always present. But there's a diff big difference between God walking with us through tragedy and God being to blame for our tragedy. It leads to, to misunderstanding who God is when we say God causes everything. I don't believe God causes every tornado, every earthquake, every hurricane. I don't believe God causes every job loss, every sickness, every disease. And I certainly don't believe every marriage that ends in divorce because of adultery is somehow part of God's master plan. I don't believe every parent who lost a child is somehow God's victim. In the midst of tragedy and senseless loss, we want answers. But to think that tragedy is always part of God's bigger plan kind of makes God uh, out to be the one who's victimizing. At best, it makes the God the offer of suffering and evil. At worst, it makes God into to someone who's experimenting with our lives and watching our pain. And that's not what Scripture really tells us at all. From the beginning of scripture in Genesis, we read the, that God made the universe and everything in it. And he placed Adam and Eve in the garden. And he gave them dominion over it. He gave them control over it. He gave them free will over creation. When we read that God gave them dominion over the garden, we realize that God is not some sort of a, a puppet master micromanaging everything. It sounds like God's intention was to be present with them, but to leave room for mankind to have a choice. It was never God's intention for Adam and Eve to disobey. Do we really think he created them specifically so they could sin? He may have known what was going to happen, but that didn't mean he caused it. They were created uh, with the ability to choose to love him or to reject him because he wanted people who would not just obey him. He thought it more important to have people who would love him. And so we too are created with this ability to to choose. We can love God or reject Him. We can do what's right or we can do what's wrong. We can love our neighbors or we can hate our neighbors. God has get put, given, given us, put within us the ability to have 
free will. And because of their choices, from the very beginning, disobedience, sin, and, the, and its consequences, which are, which are death, have been to blame for most of the tragedy we face in life. God's not to blame. Humankind's choices in the end are to blame. Let's jump to the, if we look back at Romans 8.28, go back a little earlier to Romans 8.22. You know, scripture is pretty clear that bad things happen in life, not because God is orchestrating them all, but because this world and its people are marred by sin. When we choose to follow our way and not God's way, we put ourselves in harm's way. And this, this has led to consequences for not only humanity, but all of creation. We're living under the curse of the weight of sin. We're, uh, and the very planet we live on is living under the weight of the curse of sin as well. In uh, Romans 8, 22, it says, We know that the whole creation is groaning together and suffering labor pains up until now. And it's not only the creation we ourselves who have the spirit as the first crop of the harvest also grown inside as we wait to be adopted and for our bodies to be set free we are saved in hope the apostle paul wrote those words and he talks about creation groaning he he personifies uh, creation here as a, a woman in labor waiting to give birth to a child. Just as humanity falls short of the glory of God, so creation as a whole needs to be redeemed. Uh, our scripture reading this morning was from Revelation chapter 21. It talks about a, a new heaven and a new earth. The reason why someday there will be a new heaven and a new earth is God will be redeeming not just our lives, but creation itself. A new heaven, a new earth. Redeeming a world in which, in which people will love God and sin will be dealt with so that it can be something similar to what we read about in the very beginning when God created the garden before sin uh, messed it up. In Revelation, we read about the curse on creation itself being removed through Christ. But right now, we live in this sin-scarred world. And not only that, but mankind is groaning as well. Those who have been saved by Christ know that even though we are saved, Everything wasn't immediately made whole. Being Finding salvation in the grace of Jesus uh, doesn't somehow miraculously transport us to the Garden of Eden or to heaven right now. We're still living in a world that is marred by sin. Sin is still at work in the world. And we do know that we are adopted as children of God when we put our trust in Christ. But we know also that we haven't fully realized yet what that means. We haven't claimed our, yet claimed our full rights as his children. We know that one day God is going to give us a new heaven and a new earth. We know one day, we talk about it all the time, we joke about it as we get older. One day God will give us new bodies. With no pain, no aches, everything works just the way that, that it should be. We know that God is making all things whole. We know that he is making all things right. But we also know that things are not yet. Not right yet. But here is where our hope comes from. Look at Romans 8, 26 and 27. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. 
The Holy Spirit is interceding for us. He is our advocate, our counselor. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us with God as we pray. He hears the greatest hurts of our hearts. He brings, uh, he brings them before God on our behalf. If God is causing everything to happen, why would God's Holy Spirit be interceding for us? If we are groaning about things God wants to happen, wouldn't that mean God is saving us from himself? Yet we know that's not true when we put it that way. That's not what this is saying. What this is saying is that God is fighting for us. We live in a sin-scarred, broken world, and in the midst of that, God is fighting for us. That's the context of this verse. God is not attacking us through his creation. He is rescuing us from the effects of sin upon his creation. Romans 8, 28 in the Common English Bible says, We know that God works all things together, all things together for the good, for the ones who love God, for those who are called according to his purposes. Let me read that to you in the NIV translation. This, this might be a little clearer. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. And we know that in all things, God works. There's a little difference there. Two, two, uh, just a couple of tiny words, or tiny letters, in. We know that God works in all things. God doesn't cause all things to happen. God works in all things to bring about good things for those who love him. Just that one little word, in, it makes a huge difference. We know that in all things, that's a more accurate translation to what the, to the point that Paul is trying to make here. No matter what happens, good or bad, explainable or unexplainable, God is at work in the midst of it. God is at work in those situations, in the lives of those who believe. God doesn't cause everything to happen, but no matter what happens, God is at work in our lives and in our midst, shaping, influencing, even the most tragic situations of our life. God will walk beside us. He will be at work in our lives, bringing good things to those who love him, even in the midst of the bad things. These are, unfortunately, all too real life examples. Perhaps there was a man who at 40 years of age dies of cancer. He leaves behind a wife and two boys. When he died, many people donated money to the family. That, those donations allowed that family to pay off a whole lot of debt and bills that they had. And so I ask you, did God cause the man to die of cancer, to rob these boys of years with their father so that his wife could pay off some bills? That sounds ridiculous. That doesn't sound like God. Or perhaps we need to see that in the midst of this horrible tragedy, God was at work in this family's midst to make sure that the family was cared for. God was working behind the scenes to bring something good for this family in the midst of something horrible. That's a very profound difference. Don't say God did this to you. Instead say, no matter what, God is with you. And he is at work in your life. And he won't necessarily save us from every bad thing that the world or the people in the world will throw our way. But he will walk through it with us. And he will continue to work in our life, caring for us in the midst. Paul was no stranger to conflict. He he wrote this letter to the Romans, to the church in Rome, while waiting for a trial 
in front of the Roman emperor. As Paul's writing this, this letter from prison uh, of some sort, when he writes in 828 uh, that God works all things for good for those who love him, what he's saying is, regardless of my circumstances, God is at work to bring about his will in the end. Do I think Paul, God wanted Paul in prison? Probably not. But man, while Paul was in prison, he wrote letters that God is still using to speak into our lives today. God brought something good out of something tragic. If we think God is behind every bad thing that happens, it leads to something we might call fatalism. Fatalism is when we say, if God causes everything to happen, then what's the use of even trying? Why should I pray for guidance if everything that happens was meant to be? What's the point of living and growing and learning? We would just let life play out. Fatalism leads to, to apathy and a lack of caring. Fatalism is when we think that we have uh, no say, no control, no role to play in life, and that's not what God created this for. Fatalism is, leads to making excuses. If God is the cause behind everything, we can avoid responsibility for our own bad decisions. <clears throat> Here's the truth. There are decisions we make every day, and every one of them comes with consequences. Every time we climb into a car and drive down the road, we know we're taking a risk. Every time a, a person smokes a cigarette, every time a, a person eats fried food, we know we're risking our health, at least a little bit. We can't blame God for our own choices, and yet that's exactly what this allows us to do. If everything happens for a reason and God is the reason, that none of us would be liable or responsible for anything that happened. Can you imagine a drunk driver saying, that's, it wasn't my fault. Can you imagine an armed robber saying, it wasn't my fault. That was God's will. If God was responsible for everything, then there's no responsibility for the, the unfaithful spouse or anything else that we might call sin in this world. We don't want to use God as an excuse for our poor choices. God cannot be blamed for the brokenness of our world when it is we who used our freedom. It is Adam and Eve and their descendants who used their freedom to make the mess that we live in. God's not the, the author of death and evil. Because the truth is, he is the author of life. You see, a God of the living or the dead, he can't be the God of both death and life. In uh, John 10.10, 10, it says, the thief, only the thief enters only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came so that they could have life. Indeed, so that they could live life to the fullest. John 10.10 10 says, says that, Jesus came so that we might not only have life, but abundant life. God's not responsible for all the evil stuff. Does this verse say that all things are good? No. Does it say that God caused all things to happen? No. It tells us that whatever happens, good or bad, God is working in our lives. God is working for the good of those who love him, even in the worst situations. Did God cause Moses to kill, an, to kill an Egyptian slave master? No. Did God take that bad thing and bring something good out of it? Sure. God used Moses to deliver the Israelites from slavery. Did God cause the Israelites to, uh, to ignore his promise when Moses led them into the promised land? No. They wandered around the, 
the desert. I don't believe that was necessarily God's ultimate aim, but he brought something good out of it. While they were in the midst of their wandering, God raised up Joshua as a leader. And eventually Israel uh, took over the promised land. Remember the story of David and Bathsheba? Did God cause David to lust after Bathsheba and eventually kill her husband to cover up his sin? No. But he did use this situation for good. He was at work in the midst of this situation because he changed David's heart. And as a result, Solomon, David and Bathsheba's son, grew up and became a king and built the temple. God brought something good out of the poor choices that David and Bathsheba made. So I guess everything does happen for a reason, but sometimes the reason is our own bad choices. We make bad decisions. The people around us make bad decisions that affect us. Sometimes the reason is just because we live in a fallen world. But the good news is that God can redeem even the worst situation. Perhaps redeem or redemption is a word that we want this morning. God doesn't cause all the bad things to happen, but God can bring redemptive work out of those difficult things. If something, if I go through a, a terrible circumstance and years later God uses me to encourage somebody going through a similar circumstance. That's, that's not God causing me or desiring me to go through that in the past. It's God bringing something good out of the fact that I did go through it. It's God re redeeming that experience. God can redeem the worst situations. And God can take the worst situations and turn them towards his ultimate purpose. As Christians, sometimes we will suffer. We don't have all the answers as to why. Sometimes it's because we sin. Sometimes it's because others sin. And just as often it's because we live in a fallen world. But let me leave you with this, this final thought. God doesn't make everything happen, but he can weave his purposes into everything that happens. He can redeem all things. He doesn't cause innocent people to go to jail or die of cancer. He doesn't cause senseless tragedies to occur. But when they do happen, he can bring beauty from the ashes. He takes everything that happens, works in and through it to bring about his purposes. We know that God works in all things together. He works all things together and brings something good out of them for his people who are called according to his purpose. God works all things together for the good of the ones who love God. And in the end, that is God's purposes. His purpose is that we would love him and he would love us. The truth is God loves you. He sees the broken world you live in. He sees the pain that is brought by our own actions and the actions of others. God doesn't cause everything to happen, but he can redeem all things that happen. And you know, the truth is, even God doesn't get everything he wants. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord isn't slow in keeping his promise as something of slowness, but he is patient toward you, not wanting anyone to perish, but, to, but all to change their hearts and lives. God doesn't want anyone to perish, but there will be people who perish. Not everyone will put their trust, trust in Christ and be saved. In the, un, in the end, some people will reject God and be lost. It won't be his fault. They will make their own choices with the freedom that he has given them. It wasn't God's fault that Adam and Eve sinned. It's not God's fault that we have sinned and fallen short of his glory. We exercise our freedom and chose ourselves over the glory of God. That's what sin always is. You know what is God's fault? 
God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that everyone who believes in him uh, won't perish, but have eternal life. That's God's fault. God is the reason why all who put their trust in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God gave us the freedom to love him. And we either use that freedom to reject him, or we do indeed love him. He didn't cause our predicament, but man, Jesus chose to redeem our predicament. The world is a scary place, but you don't have to walk through it alone. Put your trust in Jesus, our Redeemer. He will give you hope and strength and encouragement and even bring blessings in the midst of this broken world. In Genesis, we find the story of Joseph. When I read that story, I get the idea Joseph may have been a little bit cocky and arrogant. Maybe I'm wrong. I do know this, his brothers hated him enough to sell him into slavery. After being sold into slavery, a, a prominent woman took advantage of him, and he was thrown into prison. Joseph's life was full of pain, but God was not the reason for Joseph's pain. But God was at work in Joseph's life. Joseph ended up in a wealthy country. He met people in prison who had connections. He was in the right place at the right time, and God provided him the means to save not only Egypt, but his own family from famine. God didn't cause bad things to happen to Joseph, but God redeemed the bad things that happened to him. Joseph loved God. When bad things happened to Joseph, God was at work behind the scenes, working in all of these things to bring something good. God was not the cause of all the bad things that happened to us, but he can be our redeemer and bring good out of the bad. It's never too late to turn to him. As we conclude this morning, we're going to have communion together. And uh, as we take communion, remember that God is not the reason for the sin-scarred world we live in. But he became flesh and blood and dwelt among us so that he might be the reason for our salvation. He might be our redeemer. The night before, Jesus chose to be our redeemer. He sat with those who had sinned, those who were imperfect. He sat with the one who betrayed him. And he broke bread. And he gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And as he sat at the table with them, that group of men, he took the cup and he gave thanks. He said, this is my blood, which is shed for you, drink in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your love. It was your love, Lord, that, that reached down into our broken world and, and offered us a, a way of salvation, a way back to you, a way of restoration, of redemption. And so, Lord, we give you praise, for you are our Redeemer. Our hope and trust is in you, and you are the only place, the only way in which we will find a relationship with you. We give you praise, we give you thanksgiving, and you ask, we ask that you would help us uh, to walk in love with you as you walk in love with us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and enjoy your afternoon.